his goal is to convince local traditional chiefs to tell security forces when Boko Haram members are in their villages. France has announced a troop surge and a new strategy to combat militancy in Mali following the death of a French soldier near Mali's Tessalit region. Unofficials are counting the votes cast in today's parliamentary election in South Africa, but the ruling African National Congress has a seemingly unassailable lead. For more on these stories and others, we go with this roundup of news. He has been killed in northern Mali. It is the eighth military casualty in Mali since Operation Selval was launched in January of last year. The soldier was killed during an attack last night in the region just south of Tessalit. Jihadist groups are still very active in northern Mali, posing a threat not only to the government but to neighboring countries. The French Minister of Defense announced a fresh deployment of troops in the area and a change of strategy. What is new is that they will be concentrated in Gao. 3,000 troops will also be deployed in what I call the Sahel Sahara danger zone where all types of trafficking will occur. When asked how long the new operation would take, Mr. Ladrion said, as long as necessary. While many South Africans have expressed dissatisfaction with the ANC, the ruling party is set to win the general elections. Preliminary results from 50% of polling stations place the ANC in the lead with 62% of the votes. The party is almost certain to win by a comfortable margin, placing it at the head of government for another five years. Strengthening economic ties between China and Africa topped the agenda at the Abuja Economic Forum. The importance of the conference has been overshadowed by attacks by Boko Haram in recent weeks. China has promised to help Nigeria in the fight against terrorism. China's Premier Li Keqiang met with several African leaders to discuss potential projects. Valerie Amos, the UN Undersecretary for Humanitarian Affairs, visited a camp in Najema, Chad, on Thursday as part of a visit which aims to raise relief aid. Chad is struggling to accommodate more than 100,000 refugees who fled the violence in the Central African Republic. President Vladimir Putin has asked for Russian activists in eastern Ukraine to put plans to hold a referendum on autonomy on hold, but the pro-Russian camp seems to be having none of that. Organizers of the vote say the referendum will take place as planned. The Russian president's unexpected U-turn comes against the backdrop of ongoing military operations to dislodge separatists from government buildings in eastern Ukraine. We have more in this report. Russians in the east of Ukraine have decided to go ahead and hold a referendum on autonomy planned for the 11th of March. Earlier, Russian President Vladimir Putin called for the vote to be postponed to allow dialogue and announced the withdrawal of Russian troops from Ukraine's border. Whilst Ukrainian separatists have decided to ignore the Russian leader's declarations. There was a vote and the decision not to postpone the referendum was passed 100 percent. I'm sure that if the referendum is not held on the 11th of May, we will not be able to hold it at all because we will have lost the confidence of the people. In the east of Ukraine, troops are still fighting to regain control of official buildings and terrain, particularly in Slavyansk, the pro-Russia separatist stronghold. During a tour of inspection, Ukraine's Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk described the Russian leader Vladimir Putin's calls to delay the referendum as hot air. I think the Russian president needs to be informed that no referendum was planned for the 11th of May. If terrorists and separatists supported by Russia got an order to postpone something that doesn't exist, it's their affair. If Russia stops financing and supporting them and withdraws troops, then the situation will stabilize. In Warsaw, NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen meeting with Poland's Prime Minister said there were no indications that Russia has withdrawn drawn its troops from the Ukraine border a day after President Putin claimed to have done so. Time now to take a second break. We'll be right back. Here we come, 
Kimale, Benjum Reume Ote, the Gambia Radio and Television Services, GRTS. GRTS Staff Association, Jingi Kalil, His Excellency the President, Chef Professor, Al Haji Dr. Yahya AJJ Jame, Nofas Kene Sumbu, Jingadlum Banquet Dina, a grand dance with a difference. Bufikeja Am Sufi Muse Am Sakh, on the 23rd of May, on the 24th of May, 2014, Seti Kipenchami Hall, featuring the now happening Queen of Balakh, Titi, Titi, Titi Safnepa, Titi, Tamane Titi, Pare Raja Kipenchami Hall. You've never seen her on stage like this before. Titi, by popular demand. Nipa the joy most totally. Anna Kaindana and the artist, Fiji Birumi. Tickets, Gala, Platinum, $60,000. Diamond, $50,000. Gold, $40,000. And the individual, $1,000. Grand dance ticket, $500 and $300 flat. For all reservations, please call 991-1992-365-5518-203-1850-682-9536. Sunyureu, Gambia. The allure of stardom and the promise of multi-million dollar contracts often lead young African players to run into the hands of traffickers masquerading as football agents. Thousands of vulnerable young African footballers are reportedly smuggled into Europe and other parts of the world by the so-called agents. The SFI report looks at some of the efforts of a Belgian foundation working to stop the exploitation of young footballers in Europe. The Jones Olympique Fusion are savoring their victory. They've just won a tournament organized by the Semilia Foundation, a Belgian organization that fights against the exploitation of young African football players abroad. Each year, nearly 15,000 young players are sent secretly to Europe, North Africa and Asia. The situation in Thailand is catastrophic for young Ivorian players whose contracts were broken either because they expired or because the Thai club that brought them over decided they didn't want them anymore. They cannot return to Cote d'Ivoire because tickets are too expensive, their visas have run out, and sometimes they end up in prison. Most of these young players live and breathe football. Their dream is to follow in the footsteps of their idols, Didier Drogba, Samuel Eto'o, and Yaya Toure. But more often than not, the dream turns into a nightmare. Young players get tricked because they want to advance, they want to leave poverty behind, or because they want to please their friends. I think it would be better to keep things calm and work together. Daniel Kouako fell victim to an unscrupulous recruiter who extracted money from him in exchange for a football contract in Qatar. Not surprising that money is an incentive, says the coach of Olympique Fusion, since young African players are paid so very little at home. Some players don't even get a salary. They get a stipend for each game. And what stipend? About 15,000 CFA francs for a victory and 5,000 for a draw. You can see it's tough for these young players. That's the equivalent of between 8 and 23 euros. Other players leave because of a lack of support. Whether it be the government, the federation, or private partners, they must get involved. We need the help of all of them. We need them to be implicated so that the young African players can be motivated to stay in their country. Daniel was lucky. He was able to return to Côte d'Ivoire after his misadventure in Qatar. But others are either not so lucky or do not want to return home because they cannot face their families. These young players were congratulated by their coach for their tournament victory. Olympic players now know that they must remain on guard as they pursue their dream of football stardom.
And before we take leave of you, a quick reminder of the day's headlines. A laboratory specializing in the production of quality and affordable eyeglasses has commenced operations. The Gambia has made significant inroads in the detection and treatment of tuberculosis, exceeding